Hello again and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the new Brahman BM789. Brahman had provided this meter along with a couple of BM786s for testing. This meter now has the most recent updates. To find the version number of the firmware, just select the triangle key and then turn on the meter. You can see this is a 789 and its firmware version 08. Shortly after the 786's release, I understand that somebody had discovered that there was a problem with the auto ranging in the ohms mode, so they went ahead and made a revision for that. I'm not sure what the other changes are to the firmware. Uh, that's something that Brahman would have to weigh in on, but this currently is the most recent version. So one of the problems that somebody had discovered shortly after the release of the 786 is if you had installed the magnetic strap and you placed it, I believe, in this orientation, Basically, you couldn't hear the beeper. All I have here is a little magnet. Let me just demonstrate that. That's a good spot right there. Now I'm just going to move the magnet away. And it's back in place. And it's back away. On this meter, let's just remove the strap for right now. And we'll go ahead and turn on the meter. And I'm going to take that same magnet and I'm going to move it across the same area. You can hear it has some effect, but not to the same degree that this 786 has the problem. So the way that they solved that was to add a magnetic shield over the beeper. Normally during these videos I wait until later on in the review before I start taking the meter apart. I think for this video though we're going to go ahead and take the meter apart. Let me just show you the differences between these two meters. Brian had provided me with two shields so I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and update the second meter. This is the one that went through the life cycle test. Again we denote that by the silver dot. So let me just go ahead and grab that. This is looking at the Brian BM786 and again right here is the beeper. And here is the IC that I've been changing to update the firmware. It's been updated a few times on this meter. Let me show you what the shield looks like. See a little stamp piece. This just fits over the beeper. Like so. You can see there's plenty of clearance. Some time ago I looked at a Goss and Ultra. That meter had latching relays designed into it. If you go back and watch the video for that, you'll see where I take a magnetic hanger and I move it over the back side of the meter and I actually change the state of those relays. And that could cause the meter to misread voltages that were being applied to it. So instead of reading, for example, a couple hundred volts, it may only read a couple of volts. So to solve that problem, I made a shield that went over the whole back side of the meter. That shield was made out of a material called netic. It's similar to other types of mu metals. And I had somebody write me about that, saying that essentially I was running the shield and the shield wasn't grounded. And I thought that was kind of strange because, again, we're looking at a magnetic shield. What you're doing is basically we are shorting out the flux lines off of the magnet. And that's essentially what we're doing here. What I'd like to do, as long as I have this meter apart, is kind of show you the differences between this and the BM789. So let's go ahead and take this apart. This meter uses the exact same housing as the 786. So again, we start by just removing the two screws at the top, and then we can slide out the battery holder. You can see it uses three AAA batteries. It's a pretty nice setup. So back here you can see the contacts. These connect between the spring and this little contact here. And we have six additional screws. There's two here, two here, and then the last two below the stand. For those who are curious, this particular meter is made in Taiwan. One thing to note, you'll notice the metal inserts that they use for the battery holder. Now for the other six screws, these are just self-tappers and they go straight into the plastic. So to remove the circuit board, there's two screws that are located below the two fuses, so these have to be removed. And then there's two additional screws. One's in the upper right of the switch, right here, and then the other one is in the lower right. The larger HRC fuse is a DMM-11AR made by Busman. You can see it's 1000 volt, fast acting. 
This particular one has an interrupt rating of 20 kA at 1000 volts AC or DC. This is a smaller fuse made by SEBA. It's marked FF400 milliamp, DMI 1000 volt, 70, 172, 40. Of course, it has the RU listing on it. Let's go ahead and we'll take out the circuit board. Again, we can see the shielding for the two meters is identical. Battery pack for the two meters is also identical. The circuit boards are identical between the two meters, and you'll see they've denoted it's a 789 by adding this little bit of solder. Notice on the 786, again the same circuit board, but it has solder added to the 786 designator. Outside of that, at a first glance, I don't see any other differences. The LCDs for the two are identical. Let's go ahead and we'll flip over the meters. Again, I had already updated the 789 to include this shield. And you can see I didn't really do a good job cleaning up that IC. I'll probably do that while I have it apart right now. Up in this area right here, you can see some of the components are added on the 789 that are not included on the 786. Same thing with this capacitor in this area here. Looks like a few more capacitors on the 789 are added down here that are not included on the 786. I think the big difference though is underneath the LCD. So let's go ahead and I'll remove the two. There you have it. So 786 obviously on the right, 789 on the left. I'm not going to take the time to pull the shield off, but you'll notice a lot of these trimmers are not present on the 786. And I'm sure that there's other differences as well that are just not visible. The BM789 as a 60,000 count meter can do 5 readings per second. It also has a 31 segment bar graph that updates at 50 times per second. It has an AC bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. It also supports the AC plus DC mode. It also sports one of the features that I like on this BM869S and that's that it has two temperature sensors so you can insert two K-type thermal couples between these two jacks and these two jacks and the meter will display two separate temperatures as well as show you the difference between the two. This meter also has a 4 to 20 scale and it can also read in dBm. Of course it can measure resistance as well as conductance. You may recall that the BM869 also had a very short back life. With the later meters they've increased that time. I'm sure that that was partly driven by the fact that this uses a 9 volt transistor battery. With the 789 they've upped that to a 16 minute backlight timer. We'll go ahead and clean up that IC a little bit before we put the meter back together. That looks a lot better. You can see the shield basically fits the same way on this meter as it does the 786. One of the things I do with these meters before I put the screws in and just insert the battery pack. Make sure we got the switch aligned. Looks like we probably do. Put the meter back together and let's just do a basic functional test. We'll start out in the AC volt mode. It should be roughly two and a half volts at 60 hertz. You can see that's correct. This output happens to be AC coupled. Let's go ahead and try DC coupled. And let's go back to AC volts. So again, this is still two and a half volts. This is at 30 hertz. Let's go to frequency again. 15 hertz. 120 hertz. This should be roughly 3.1 kilohertz. Looks good. Let's go to AC plus DC. And this should read roughly 90 volts, 88.3 on AC volt mode. This should be reading roughly 70 volts, 65 and a half. And for DC, it should be roughly 60 volts, 58.4. Say we're in the ballpark. It should be roughly 115. Yep, typically that's what we see, 118 millivolts. Let's just change over to ohms. As long as it's in conductance, this is a 1 giga ohm or roughly 1 nano semen.
Let's try it with our 100 meg. This should be roughly 10 nano siemens. And this is our 40 meg or roughly 25 nano semen. Now again to be clear, Bryman has told me that when I change that controller IC that it could affect the alignment of the meter. So if these are off a little bit, don't assume that that's a problem with the meter. It's very possible that making those changes has caused that effect. Just something to be aware of. Let's go to resistance. Let's just try our 40 mega ohm resistor. Really close. Let's try it with our 100. Yeah, can't read that. I think that it taps off at like 60 mega or something. This will be 10 mega ohm and this is a 0.1% part. Drifts a little bit. It looks good. Let's try it with a 1 meg. And this is a 100k ohm. This is a 0.1%. This will be a 10k ohm, 1%. This is a 1k ohm, 0.1%. One hundred ohms, point zero one per cent. Fifty ohms, point zero one per cent. Let's go ahead and zero out the meter. So again, this is a one ohm, one per cent. This meter has the beep check. You can see how it lights up the backlight. You can see as I leave it shorted, it'll flash the backlight. Here's a single diode. You can hear it beep. It's got a diode beep check. And this is with two diodes. And this is a white LED. Of course it lights that just fine. This should be roughly 2.5 uh, volts drop. Let's try it in capacitance mode. And this should be 150 picofarads. Looks good. Fairly fast, I'd say good enough. This is a 1 nanofarad. 102, I can buy that. 0.1 microfarad. Looks good. This will be a 1 microfarad. Very good. Let's try a 10 microfarad. Looks good. And this is our 100 microfarad. Reading a little high. Let's just bring out my buddy's old meter. Call it 104 microfarads. Let's just try it with my BM869S. This is the one that had the switch life cycle tested. It was also damaged during one of my tests. I'd say pretty much spot on with my friend's old Fluke 189. My guess is this meter's out a little bit in that mode. Again, I'm not too surprised seeing that Bryman had already told me that changing out that chip could have affected it. Probably needs to be sent in and have it realigned. I'm sure if I asked they would probably do that for me, but just for these reviews I think we're okay to go ahead and continue. Let's try it with the temperature. This should be roughly 1040 degrees or so. And this should be 24 or so degrees. This should be about 500. Let's just leave the box set there. And let's select the second temperature sensor. So there's T2. You can see roughly the same value. And again, here's the highest setting, so roughly 1,040. And again, this should be roughly 24 degrees. So again, with the leads plugged on to T1, pot set roughly to the center, this should again be typically 500 degrees Celsius. Let's just switch it over to the DC millivolts. It should be roughly 20 millivolts. Let's just compare that with the BM869S. Again, millivolts DC. And you can see 20.06. Let's change this one over to temperature. 
and you can see about 518 or so degrees Celsius so let's try our current input you can see it has the check for the leads being in the wrong position let's just change it over to microamps so this should be 100 microamps 10 microamps 1 microamp and 100 nanoamps looks fairly good let's go to milliamps and just set it to the 100 microamp setting again looks accurate enough Alright, so all three meters are in series and they're attached to my bench power supply these are all set to their milliamp function let's just go ahead and I'll increase the current a little bit all fairly close The fluke is fused at 400 milliamps, so I won't take it up any higher. You can see all the meters read basically the same values. Again, all three meters are in series, and they're currently set to their amps function. Let's just go ahead and turn up the current a little bit. This is about the limit of our power supply. All three meters are reading roughly the same value. Off to my left, you can see I have one of our high voltage power supplies out. Currently, both of these meters are attached in parallel and they're set to their DC volt modes. We'll go ahead and change the power supply to the higher voltage range. Let's go ahead and increase it. Looks like the two meters are basically reading the same value. Let's take it up a little higher. Looks really good. And this is the limit of the power supply right here. So just under a kilovolt. See both meters are reading dead on with each other. So I've gone ahead and restrapped it for a negative voltage. And let's just set them to roughly the halfway point. Again, they look fairly close, I'd say. And let's go ahead and take it on up. Again, that's the maximum I can get out of this power supply. So a negative thousand volts. You can see the two meters are spot on with each other. Both meters are now set to their AC volt mode. Now I have our power supply set to AC. Let's go ahead and turn it on. And you can see we're outputting roughly 276 volts. I've gone and changed both meters to their DC voltage mode. Now let's play with the bias voltage a little bit. Again, if we look at the frequency, you can see we're running these at 200 hertz right now. and that's about the limit of our DC offset right there let's try it at a negative voltage again the two meters are tracking really well sorry about that the batteries died in the camera so we're displaying both the AC and the DC voltages separately on the Fluke 189 you can see the AC component is 465 volts and the DC component is a negative 265 Let me just take this all the way up, so right about here is our peak. Looks like about 468 volts DC and 470 volts AC. Now let's go ahead and select the AC plus DC mode. And you can see again, both meters are reading fairly close with one another. So it appears that all the changes that Bryman had made to the BM786 were also implemented with the 789. So it looks like the latest version of the firmware doesn't have any issues with this test. Just to give you an idea how bad this test really is. So off to my left, this is an 87V. Apparently this is one of the more coveted meters. I never really understood why. I bought this meter a couple of years ago just for these tests. This particular one has been through the life cycle testing. The specs on this are not all that great. But personally... I'd take the 189 over this 87V any day for electronics work. I think this would make a good meter for maybe technicians working out in the shop, but yeah, it's not something I would ever want on the bench. Anyway, currently the 87V is attached in parallel with the 786. Again, both these meters have been updated to handle this test. Again, the two cables going up to the supply, so basically all three meters are in parallel. Let's just go ahead and turn on our power supply. 
Look at this. So it's reading 27.31 volts versus 51.4 and 51.4. Again, let's go ahead and manually range this. There you go, 51 volts. Still a little low. 51. Let's go back to auto range. Let's go ahead and increase the voltage. And see, there's almost 100 volts. Two Brahmins are matching. It's reading about 47 on the fluke. Here we shifted ranges. And you can see now the meter is reading correct. Now let's go ahead and drop the voltage. And eventually when this thing down shifts right there it happened. You can see now it's reading wrong again. And if we go the other direction. Again here's a negative 25 volts. See our fluke is reading negative 6. Again, negative 100 volt. Fluke is reading roughly 38. Eventually it should shift. There it goes. 182 and across the board 182 now. Again, if we place the meters into AC mode, they should all read basically the same value. And let me adjust the bias. And again, this shouldn't have any effect on the AC voltage. And you can see it doesn't. Again, keeping in mind that I've changed out this IC on the BM786 as well. And again, just to be clear, Brahman has told us that changing out that IC can affect the accuracy of the meter. So, this discrepancy of 5 volts between these two meters, to me that's not really a concern. Had I bought these two meters from Brahman, I would expect these to track much closer so anyway, this really isn't a unique problem just for Fluke. I've been very impressed with what Bryman's done with the firmware for this new series of meters being able to handle this particular test. You can see I have our little thermal chamber out. Again, this is nothing more than a meat packing box. Got a couple of peltiers that fit up in the top with a blower. Currently the meter is set to its millivolt range and you can see we have basically a one millivolt source attached. This is derived off of our Fluke reference. And you can see we have a small camera pointed at the screen. We'll be using this to monitor the meter off and on during the test. And we can get an idea how much this meter is going to drift. So I'll go ahead and close this thing up. The horizontal axis is in seconds. And the vertical axis is in degrees Celsius. The full width of the screen represents roughly a half an hour. We're in the middle of summer right now, so the office is quite warm, so it's been pretty difficult to get it down to minus 5. But notice that the meter hasn't changed any. I'll let it sit like this for maybe another 10 minutes, and then we'll go ahead and start the ramp up. So the FedEx truck just arrived. This is a brand new BM789 that Ryman provided. I had ran into a problem with our original BM789 and Ryman feels it's a alignment problem with the meter after I swapped out the control IC. We'll put a silver dot on the original 789. That way we can easily tell the two meters apart. You can see the two meters are identical. Let's just go ahead and have a look at the firmware version for this meter. Again, we just select the triangle, power up the meter. Should be version 8. It is. So again, that's the same version of the firmware that we had installed in our older meter. 
The first thing I'd like to do with this meter is just go through a quick functional test. This should be two and a half, and this should be two and a half. Let's look at the frequency. This should be 60 hertz, 60 hertz, 30 hertz. That looks fine. Let's go to DC volts. This should be five volts. As long as we're in AC plus DC, this should be roughly 90 volts. And let's try it in DC mode. This should be about 60. Looks about right. And let's try it in AC volt mode. This should be roughly 70. This should be about 20 millivolts. Looks good. You can see it powers up in nano siemens. Let's just try it with our leads open for starts. Let's try it with our 100 mega ohm. Again, this should read 10 nano siemens. Looks good. And let's just go to resistance real quick. This should be roughly a 1 meg. This is a 1% part. This is a 100k. 0.1%. This is a 10k ohm. 1%. 1k, 1%. 100 ohms, 0.01%. Say resistance looks fine. Let's just go to continuity check real quick. Looks fine. Let's try capacitance. Again, the other meter had a problem with this. Well, it's in diode check right now. We'll just go ahead and check that real quick. Here's a single silicon diode. And here are two in series. Looks fine. And again, capacitance mode. And it seems like the other meter read a little high. Maybe on the 100 microfarad. I think this is what our fluke was reading, 104. I'd say that that's good. Let's try with our 10 microfarad. Good enough. And here's our 1 microfarad. Looks good. And this is with our 150 picofarads. Looks fine. This is a 0.1 microfarad. 102, that's normal. And 1 nanofarad. Looks good. And let's go to temperature real quick. This should be roughly 500 degrees Celsius. Good enough. Let's try the other side. So, should read roughly the same value. It does. So, that looks good. Let's go to current real quick. And this should be roughly 100 microamps. Looks real good. And let's go to the microamp scale. So, Again, 100 microamps. That looks fine. This is one microamp. Looks good. So yeah, the meter looks like it's fine. So what I'd like to do, as long as we're set up for our battery light test, is just go ahead and check this meter as well. So again, to do that, we just pop our cover. Some time ago, Brahman had sent me one of the earlier prototypes. The meter wasn't functional. They basically sent it as scrap. They had been using it for some sort of testing. It had various jumper wires and whatnot on it. We're going to be using this to test the battery life of the meter. So off to my left, you can see I have our homemade source meter. Currently it's just attached to the Bryman BM869S. So we'll just insert this into the back of our meter. So now all we have to do is attach our pigtail up to the source meter. Again, this supplies the battery voltage and then monitors the current that the meter uses. It also walks us through a series of tests where we enable the backlight and set the meter to its various functions. And then with all that information, we can get an idea what the battery life for this meter is going to be. Again, I'd like to just get an idea how this new meter compares against the original one that we swapped the IC out on a few times now. So again, we just clip our leads to the meter and we can go ahead and turn it on. Now we enable the backlight. Okay, so now we disable the backlight. And now we're going to cycle the meter through its various modes. And now our source meter is going to change our supply voltage. Start ramping it down again, wait for the meter to turn off. And that's all there is to it. So this is looking at the software that I use to control the source meter. Let's just select the post processing. And now let's select add waveform. So this is all the data for the meters I've collected so far. 
Let's just go ahead and load up the original 789 and we'll also add the new one. So we're currently looking at the power in milliwatts that the two meters use. You can see they're very comparable. We start out at about 30 milliwatts. When we turn on the backlight, it goes up to about 190 or so milliwatts. Down here we can see where we're going through the different modes of the meter. Let's go ahead and select current. So about 42 milliamps or so of current draw with the backlight on. And the average is about 6 or so milliamps. Down here you can see as I'm ramping the voltage down, the current eventually just drops off and that's where the meter turns off at. If we want to compare this against the other meters that I've looked at, we can go ahead and hit flush, add directory, and let's load up all the data. Again, this is looking at current. It's interesting as some of them you can see as we start ramping down the voltage, the current goes up. Other ones, it stays fairly flat. This gives you some idea how they've designed that regulator. Let's go ahead and look at the power draw. You can see the one here in light blue. This one is certainly drawing the most power, and this is probably our Unity UT181A. Let's just go ahead and deselect that. Yep. In this funky looking gold one here, this is probably the Yokogawa. Yep. We can also display this in table format. To the far right, this is looking at the nominal battery life. You can see the worst meter by far is the Unity UT181A at about 40 hours operation. And the best meter to date has been the free one from Harbor Freight. This one will operate off a single 9 volt transistor battery for about 1300 hours. Let's see, up here is the 786. And you can see it is roughly 117, 118 hours. And just below that is the 789. Looks like about 150 hours of operation for those two meters. Up here, this is the BM869S. And you can see on a single transistor battery, this meter is good for roughly 80 hours of operation. So I mentioned that I ran into a small problem with the original BM789 that Brahman had supplied. Again, what had happened is that as I've changed out the IC to update the firmware on this, it's basically caused this meter to go out of alignment. And that misalignment has caused the meter to hunt as it would go between ranges. So let me just demonstrate that really quick. Off to my left, I have my power amplifier. Again, this is attached to an ARB. This is just a cooling fan to keep the heat sink cool. We'll go ahead and turn this on, and you can see we're outputting roughly 9.9 .9 volts. What I'm going to do now is just adjust this down to the switch point, so roughly 6.5 volts or so. And you'll see what happens is this meter on the left, again, you can see the silver dot up in the corner. Uh, this meter will begin to hunt. So right here you can see the problem. And it'll do that in every range. Of course, this meter is 60,000 count, and that's why we're looking at roughly 6.5 volts. Let's go ahead and take it up a little higher. So again, we can see it roughly 66 volts, how the meter again begins to hunt. And here we're up at 660 volts. And once again, we can see the original meter hunting. Unfortunately, I am not equipped to be able to align one of these meters. So the easiest way to move forward was for Bryman to supply me with a brand new meter that's been factory aligned. Currently our power generator is attached to the ARB. And we're going to be running through a series of waveforms. These waveforms will be at different voltage levels. They'll have various shapes and harmonic content. So again, for this next test, we'll be using the brand new BM789. And we'll be comparing that against this vintage Fluke 8506A. This is a thermal RMS meter. This meter was a rescue from the dumpster and it needed some work. And unfortunately this meter needs to be aligned. So I used one of my old 6.5 place meters as a reference to align this. I have not touched anything with the AC sections because I don't have anything that's as accurate as what this meter would have been to begin with. I was a little concerned that I'd be doing more harm to the meter than good. We'll also be comparing this against a Fluke 189 that a friend of mine had given me. My friend's Fluke 189 hasn't been calibrated in quite a few years, so I'm really not sure what the absolute accuracy of these two meters are. 
but it should give us some idea how this 789 compares. So let's just go ahead and we'll start that test. Next what I'd like to do is compare how fast this meter auto ranges compared with some of the other meters that I have available. To my far left, this is the SEM DT9939. This is a 40,000 count meter. The UEI 121GW, the Fluke 189, the Brahman BM869S, the Yokogawa TY720, and the TPI1942. This meter is actually produced by Summit. These are all 50,000 count meters. Of course, the Bryman BM789, and then the Unity UT181A. These are 60,000 count meters. And to my far right, this is the Gossen M248B, by far the most expensive meter you see up here. And this is a 300,000 count meter. Resolution wise, all these meters can resolve down to 0.01 ohms. The exception is the 121GW, the TPI 1942, and the Gossen BM 248B. All of these have a resolution of 0 .001 ohms. This is what we'll be using to test the meters. Here we have a 9 volt transistor battery. There's various FETs. There's three outputs. Again, we'll hook this up to our function generator and we'll supply this with a square wave at a fairly low frequency. And then these FETs are in series with a 10 ohm resistor. So essentially we either open circuit the meters or we apply a 10 ohm resistor across them. You can see I have our little circuit. 
attached to all three of these meters. We'll just start with the SEM and the UEI meter. Again, the Bryman BM789 in the center. For those of you who are members of the Firmware of the Month Club, this is using 2.02. .02. There must be enough leakage that this thing can't actually show an open circuit. Anyway, we can see that the 121GW is a fair bit slower than the BM789. Off to my left, this is the Fluke 189 that my friend had given me, and my Bryman BM869S to the right. It's interesting for the open circuit the fluke is very fast but when inserting the 10 ohm this 789 is quicker than these two meters again the yokogawa ty 720 off to the left to my right the tpi summit 1942 again the tpi being able to resolve down to 0 0.001 ohms Yokogawa is very slow compared to the other two. Hard to say, this may be on par with the 121GW. Let's just add it back into the mix and see. Definitely for the open range, the 121GW is much slower than the Yokogawa. Before we run the next two, I was kind of curious with this UEI if they didn't by chance reverse the current. Sure enough, so you can see I've had to flip the leads. So what's happening is it's measuring the intrinsic diode of the FET. So that makes a lot more sense as far as what's going on. Normally you're not going to have a polarity when you're measuring a resistor, but in this case we do. Getting a little quicker on the release. Last we have the Unity UT181A. Unfortunately I was going to run this test yesterday and I went to turn on this meter and the battery was of course completely flat. So I put it on the charger overnight, and I think we got up to about 90% by the time I got up in the morning. So it's still not quite fully charged, but that's one of the real downsides to a meter like this is I can't just take another battery and insert it. When this thing's dead, it's dead. You have to wait about 24 hours for this thing to charge back up. Not to mention that it's not very robust, like all other Unity meters that I've looked at. You can see again, it looks like... The Unity also reverses the polarity. Let's go ahead and flip the two leads around. Yep, sure enough. I think this Gossen is by far the slowest meter I have. But again, it's 300,000 count. It's probably the closest thing I have to a bench meter. Unfortunately, this meter has a lot of design issues. A lot of it is from the fact that the meter doesn't have proper shielding. This particular meter has been modified, so I've got some homemade shields that fit inside the back of the meter and also towards the front of it. Let's go ahead and we'll bring out this Yokogawa again. Let's see how that compares against that Gossen. This is the Unity UT61E. Again, this meter has been highly modified. Hardly anything on the meter has not been touched. But for auto ranging, the meter should behave basically like any of the others. You can see it's automatic backlight here enabled. See, as I twist it towards the light, it goes off. <laughs> oh, again, we can see. I'll bet you the polarity is flipped. 
Yep. Might just be a function of some of these really cheap meters. That's fast. Again, this meter is 20,000 counts. Now comes my favorite part of these videos. We're going to start doing some destructive testing. Now, because I previously ran the BM786, and with these two meters being built on the exact same platform, there's a few tests that I'm not going to be running. So we're not going to be performing the drop test. I'm not going to be exposing the meter to chemicals. I'm also not going to life cycle the function switch. So what I'm going to be doing is using the meter that I've changed the IC out on. Again, you can see that by the silver dot in the upper left. We'll be using this for all of our destructive testing. So in the future, if we want to use the 789 for other comparison tests, we'll be keeping this last one that they sent us in pristine condition. It's similar to the 786 on the left. Uh, this one on the right is the one that had gone through all the destructive testing. This one was never exposed to any of that. So let's go ahead and get started for this first test. We're going to be using our grill starter. Again, to perform this test, we'll be exposing the meter to five transients, both positive and negative. And again, the way we do that is by reversing the two leads. It'll be a direct discharge. Again, if you're interested in knowing what this transient looks like coming off of this, I've made a video about that on part two, I believe, of the UT181A review. So I wanted to characterize it against the IEC standards. And of course the transient coming off of this is quite weak by comparison. We'll just start with the low Z mode. And we just reverse the leads to change the polarity. And that's it. Now we'll go ahead and perform a functional test on the meter. Before I do that, let's just have a quick look in the ohms mode, because this is typically a dead giveaway. What will happen is the meter will start to leak. You can see we're on nano semen mode, and it's reading zero. Resistance, it's reading an open. Let's just try it with temperature real quick. Again, you can see it's reading open lead. And with capacitance, it's reading zero. All good indications that the meter's fine. I'll go ahead and functional test it off camera. All right, so the 789 appears to have survived the grill starter test. So again, I built this transient generator. Again, this closely mimics the IEC standard. So again, we'll be applying five transients, both positive and negative, with the meter set to each mode. Alright, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. So the 789 survived that test just fine. Here it is attached to a 1 mega ohm resistor. Let's give you some idea for the accuracy of this meter. Let's just go to DC mode. Again, this box has an Apex VRE305AS. This is a 5 volt reference. So again, the meter is fairly accurate after all the work that I've done to it. Next we'll be using our transient generator. Let's go ahead and set that up. It's been a while since I've done any type of meter testing. It's probably worth mentioning again that these tests have nothing to do with the IEC safety standards. Again, what I'm interested in is how robust these meters are electrically. It's a big difference between those tests. When I started out, I looked at what the industry was doing for testing the meters. Of course, they have the IEC 61326 EMC standard, and that covers the static discharge test that we just ran. Basically, I was looking for something that closer mimicked what I was doing in the lab. So I looked at the surge test. Of course, that's being done with a combo generator. So there's an open circuit voltage waveform as well as a short circuit current waveform. And what I did is I decided to follow the open circuit voltage waveform. And that's what this generator is based on, roughly. 
So this generator puts out a 100 microsecond full width half height instead of the 50 microseconds that the IEC standard calls for. It does have a 2 ohm source, but it's limited to about 15 joules. So this generator can no way come even close to meeting what those combo generators have put out. I've actually had people write me about testing surge protectors and other online AC to DC converters for, I don't know, charging different devices and whatnot. And again, that just tells you how confused people People are this testing has nothing to do with that type of testing this is again strictly to test these meters robustness again let me just give you an example so here I have a standard incandescent bulb this is rated for 120 volts let's just go ahead and turn on our generator I'll attach this to the output of the generator so currently this is set for a 1000 volt transient so what will happen is when I hit the start button, you'll see this bank voltage charge up and then we discharge it into the lamp. What will happen is if I take out this light bulb, the waveform is basically going to have this exponential decay. I've had people say that I was actually discharging the meter across a capacitor bank. Again, that just shows you the ignorance of many people that are out there watching these videos. That's not what's happening here at all. Again, the transient generator has an output network that controls the shape of the waveform. So if I hit go right now, you see it charging up, reaches a thousand volts, and then it does the discharge. So when we attach our light bulb, most of the energy is being dissipated by the bulb. With the light bulb removed, it's being dissipated by the generator. So again, you can see it charging up. There's our thousand volts. And you'll notice you don't even see the filament flash. Again, that filament's only rated for 120 volts. And you can see it doesn't even begin to light it. There's just not enough energy in this transient to do that. Let's go ahead and take this thing up a little higher. So this is set for 2,000 volts. Now let's see if the bulb will light. Oh, right there. Let me just put it down on the mat. Maybe it'll show up a little better. Let me turn off the lights. Right there. So that's 2 kilovolts. This is going to be 3,000 volts across that little filament. Oh, it's arcing at the base. You can just go ahead and check this real quick with the ohm meter. And sure enough, you can see about 43 ohms. Of course, if we take out the bulb, open circuits. So the filament's just fine. It's just breaking down at the base of the bulb. But it gives you some idea. Again, we're not talking about a lot of energy here. Another thing that came up early on in the testing is people were saying that the probes that I was using were unsafe for this type of testing. Again, nothing could be further from the truth. Basically, you have people that are electricians that are looking at this somehow not understanding that, again, this has nothing to do with the safety standard. Those people will be looking at it from a surge or an arc flash test. And if we were running tests like that, of course those probes wouldn't be good for CAT3, CAT4 testing. But again, that's not what we're doing in these tests. So keep that in mind as we begin our transient testing that, again, what we're interested in looking at is how robust this meter is and how it compares against other meters that I've looked at in the past. First thing we're going to be doing is supplying a full rectified AC voltage to the front end of the meter. Again, that signal is being derived from our transient generator. Turn it on here. You can see our meter is reading roughly 234 volts DC. Now what I'm going to do is rotate the knob through all the different settings and we'll see if this damages the meter. Again, we can see 120 volts AC, 233 volts DC, millivolts at overranges, ohms at overranges, capacitance, it looks like it's going to hunt, and temperature, it's just going to read and open. We'll go ahead and turn that off, and then we'll go ahead and functional test the meter. So the 789 survived that first test just fine. So again, we'll just start off in the first mode, and we'll apply five transients. Uh, 
again we reverse the leads to change the polarity of the transient and that's it 789 survived that test just fine I've gone ahead and reprogrammed the generator for 1.5 kilovolts and that's it all right the meter passes functional test just fine so that was 1.5 kilovolts I've reset our generator for 2,000 volts and here we go and that's it the BM 789 survived that test just fine again that was 2,000 volts peak with a 100 microsecond full width half height and a 2 ohm source impedance so this is looking at the current spreadsheet again this is the online version anybody can look at this if they'd like I'll put a link in the description give you some idea at 2000 volts how many meters had failed at this point let's see we have the Maztec MS 8264A we have the Gardner Bender GDT 311 and we have the Centec 98025 so kind of go through the more recent tests it looks like we had the Unity UT61D that failed the piezo grill starter the Unity UT61E that failed the piezo grill starter the Klein MM2000 that failed at 2000 volts we have the Amprobe AM530 that failed at 1.5 kilovolts we have the Tech Power TP40 that failed at 1.5 kilovolts. We also have the Tech Power TP2844R that failed the rectified AC line test. The BK2705B that failed at 1000 volts. And so did the Circuit Test DMR6550, the Southwire 12070T. The UTL UTL DM-2 and then the ANOVA 3320 all those meters failed at 1000 volts and we have the XTEC EX540 that failed the piezo grill igniter of course then we have this one here this is the one that people love to hang their hat on this is a Fluke 87V it was a very old meter and it failed at 1.5 kilovolts so you had people using that as an excuse for why their meters don't need to perform any better we actually went back and I bought a brand new meter and that meter performed very well and then I made a video where I took this original meter back apart and we analyzed each section of the circuitry of that I never did figure out why it failed but we did repeat the test and the meter performed very well and that was after repair so I'm not sure if the meter actually had something in it that got vaporized during the test or what happened but but again that particular old 87V failing at 1.5 kV that was definitely an outlier let's see what else has failed so we have the Vichy VC99 the Unity UT181A those both failed the piezo grill starter and down here it looks like we have the Unity UT20B then we have that high dollar TPI 1942 as well as the Maztec MS8211 all those failed the AC line test 1kV it looks like the Woods DMM W3 it failed that test at one and a half kilovolts it looks like we have the Maztec MS8211D as well as the Victor VC921 Here's, the, here's a few more that failed. This is the Owan BT41T. Looks like that failed the AC line test. And then we have the Meter K MK01A that failed the piezo grill starter, along with the 121GW that also failed the piezo grill starter. Again, that particular meter still sort of functioned. It wasn't like totally out, it just had a lot of leakage. It could no longer measure accurately. So that gives you some idea this meter has already surpassed a lot of the meters that I've looked at. So we're going to continue with our testing now. Transient generator is set for 2,500 volts. We'll see how it does with that. Again, my confidence is high that we're not going to see any problems. Here we go. 
at the 2.5 kilovolts that we're now running. The meters that had failed this test are the Greenlee DM20, the SEM DT9939, and it looks like the Anig and 8008. $50 meters I was testing at 2.8 kV instead of 2.5 kV and it looks like the BK2703 failed that test as well as the Xtech MN16A. And that's it. I've had people tell me that I run these tests so fast and I'm not giving the mobs a chance to cool down and you know we're stressing the mobs and boy it's just it's all about the mobs. You know, if you look at a meter, you have this surge rated resistor that's going to be in series with the PTC. This is a 1K. It's typically about 1.3K. And then we go to the MOV, which is going to be normally in series with another MOV, get us up a little bit over 1,000 volts. Normally the PTC isn't going to respond fast enough to a transient like this just because of the thermal mass. So what ends up happening is we subtract off the voltage of the two MOVs and then the rest is divided by the two resistors, the PTC and the surge rate resistor. It really is a shame that more people don't understand these basic circuits. You go out on the internet, there's a lot of people reviewing meters, and boy, you'll see them calling PTCs MOVs, MOVs PTCs. They really have no idea how any of this works, and they're presenting themselves as being the expert on these meters and trying to tell you what's good and what's not. And of course, on this channel, you really don't get a lot of my feelings about these meters as far as if they're good or bad. What you do get is a lot of data. So it looks like the BM789 survived 3000 volts just fine. As you can see I brought out our Tektronix scope probe. This is attached to our oscilloscope. And let's just go ahead and select normal. And I'm going to go ahead and just kick off a single transient. And there we have it. So you can see the scope is currently set at 100 microseconds per division and 1000 volts per division. You can see the waveform is four divisions up or 4000 volts peak. And if we look two divisions up and then one division over, so 100 microsecond full with half height. This is the transient that we're going to be using to test the meter next. Okay, here we go. You can see having the meter connected doesn't change the wave shape. So the next four modes, the millivolts, the ohms, the diode check or the capacitance check, and the temperature monitor will all engage the low voltage clamp. So if it's going to break down, I would typically expect it to be one of these modes. have a look. Wait for the scope to trigger. Right there it is. And again the wave shape looks the same so there's no sign of any breakdown. If the meter were to break down this would just basically be a little spike. It would decay very quickly because we're drawing a lot more current. Again basically the meter is acting like an open circuit right now which is what I was saying most of the energy is basically being dissipated by the generators internal output network. You can see changing the polarity has no effect as far as the shape of the wave. Okay, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. This was the last transient that was applied and again we can see there's no signs of any breakdown occurring. So the 789 pass is functional. So that was 4000 volts. I've gone ahead and reset our generator for 5000 volts peak. You can see it here so this is now 5 divisions up. And again at the 2.5 divisions up we are 1 division over or 100 microsecond full with half height. We're getting close to what the generator can actually output. It's just shy of 6,000 volts. And I came up with that number based on how the original $50 meters that I looked at ran. So there was one meter, it was an Amprobe AM510. 
and that particular meter was damaged at like 5.8 or something kV so I use that for the upper end criteria for this transient generator alright so again this is going to be 5000 volts peak and again no sign of any breakdown curve looks really nice All right, that's it. We'll go ahead and functional test the meter. So this is looking at all the data I've collected for the meters that I've tested so far. Again, this is available online for free if you'd like to download a copy. So before we run the next test, let's have a look at how many meters have actually survived up to this point. So this top set of data is the meters from the $50 shootout. So if we look at the 5.8 kilovolts that we're about to run, we can see only one meter is passed at that level, and that's the Fluke 101. We can see the Amprobe AM510, which was the runner-up from the shootout, failed at 5.8 kilovolts. So everything that's shown in purple is with our new transient generator. The yellow is using our original transient generator. And we can see 5.9 kilovolts. This is essentially the top end of that generator. And we can see not very many meters are alive at this point. We have the Bryman BM-786, the Yokogawa TY-720, the Bryman BM-27S, the Bryman BM-839, the Bryman BM-319, the Gassen Metrowatt M248B, the Bryman BM-235. This is a modified UT61E. Of course, without those modifications, that meter would have been damaged with the grill starter. We also have the modified Unity UT181A. Again, that meter was damaged with the grill starter. It's a very common problem that I see with the Unity brand. We also have the Hioki DT4252, the Unity UT15C. Of all the Unity products I've looked at, that one survived to the highest level. But again, that's not your typical DMM, that's a high voltage probe. We also have the Fluke 115, the Fluke 101, the Fluke 17B+, Plus, the Fluke 87V. Of course, we have the old one, as well as a brand new one. This one is after repairs. We also have the Fluke 107, as well as the Radio Shack 220087. But you can see a very low percentage of meters have actually survived to this level. Again, most of those have been Bryman and Fluke brands. We would see a lot more failures, but what's happened is over time I started running a much higher class of meters. And of course those meters have proven to be more robust than the cheaper meters that I started out testing. Alright, it's a new day. Hopefully we can finish up our testing. So I checked the BM789 last night. It had survived that 5000 volt peak transient. So I've got our generator set for its maximum output. This is roughly 5.8 or so kilovolts peak. Again, this is a 100 microsecond full width half height with a 2 ohm source impedance. We'll be applying 5 transients, both positive and negative, with the meter set to each mode. Here we go. Alright, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. Just to give you some idea, it looks like there's about 52 minutes on the clock of the transient generator. Alright, let's just have a look at the basic functionality. Again, this should be roughly 500 degrees Celsius. Room temp, a little over a thousand. That appears to be fine. This should be roughly 20 millivolts or so. 
looks good. In the DC voltage mode, this should be 5 volts. Looks good. This should be roughly 60 volts. Looks good. Let's try it in AC plus DC. Should be roughly 90 volts. Looks good. Let's try it in AC. This should be roughly 70 volts. Looks good. This should be two and a half. That looks fine. And this should be two and a half. Let's go to frequency. This should be roughly 60 hertz. And this should be 60 hertz as well. This will be 15 hertz. Let's go to resistance. This should be 1 ohm. This should be 50 ohms. And this is a 0.01% part. This is a 100 ohms. Again, 0.01%. This is a 1K 0.1%. This is a 10K 1%. This is a 100K 0.1%. This is a 1 mag 1%. This is a 10 mag 0.1%. Continuity test looks like that's fine. Let's look at conductance. So this is a 100 mega ohm should be 10 nano semen Looks fine. This is a 1 giga ohm should read 1 nano semen That looks fine. Let's just try it in capacitance. This is our 150 picofarad Looks good 160 this is a 0.1 microfarad Looks good. One nanofarad. Looks good. This is our one microfarad. Looks good. Ten mic. And this is our 100 mic. And this reads a little high with this meter. Let's go to low Z mode real quick. And let's try it with our 5 volt. Looks close. Let's try it with our two and a half volts. And we're DC coupled now. You can see it's picking up the DC and it's reading two and a half volts as well. So it looks like our BM789 has survived the 5.8 kilovolt transient. Well, I'm sure this video is well over an hour now. I think we're going to end it on this test. If there's other tests you'd like to see performed with this particular meter, let me know. And maybe we can set something up. Hope you enjoyed the video and hope everybody's staying safe. So until the next video, later.